So thank you all for coming here together to, tonight. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to address you all. I want to thank CC, Ken, Joel, uh, and so many other community leaders that do all the work that, that brought us here today. I'm running for president because I believe that we're going through the greatest economic and technological transition in the history of the world. And right now, the United States is, for whatever reason, unable to acknowledge it. And I came to this realization over a period of really the last decade or so. So, my background, my parents met at Berkeley. Who here went to Berkeley? Anybody? I know some people here did, right? So my parents met at Berkeley in the 60s. My father has a doctorate in physics. He generated 69 US patents over his career uh, for IBM and GE. And my mother is an artist. She got her master's and her undergraduate degree at Berkeley. And my older brother is named after the Lawrence Observatory. We used to joke that my parents got frisky in that observatory, but I'm sure they did, and I'm sure they just saw the name. Then they moved to Schenectady, New York, where I was born. I was born in upstate New York, and then I grew up in Westchester County, and then I went to prep school in New Hampshire at Phillips Exeter Academy, went to Brown University where I studied economics, and then I went to law school at Columbia. So I was a corporate attorney for five months at a law firm called Davis Polk and Mordwell in New York City, doing M&A and banking legal work. And I found that that job was not a great fit for me, uh, so I left to start a dot-com company in the first dot-com bubble in 2000. And that company had its mini rise and maximum fall because that was not a great time to start a company in 2000. <laughs> and so after my company went out of business, I worked for another entrepreneur at a healthcare software company for a number of years. And then I became the CEO of an education company that helped people get into the best business schools and law schools in the country. And that company became number one in the United States while I was CEO for those six years and was acquired by the Washington Post in 2009. So while I was there, I personally taught the analyst classes at Goldman Sachs, McKinsey, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and I saw that there were many young people that uh, were doing jobs that they didn't really want to be doing. They did those jobs because they were really good at school and they were told these were the jobs they should do. And so I thought, well, what would I want those young people to do if I could draw it up? And I came up with the idea for something that became Venture for America, which is that I thought that young, smart people in this country should be starting businesses in places like Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, Baltimore, New Orleans, and other cities around the country. So I donated 120000 of my own to see that organization and started calling wealthy friends asking, do you love America? And then the savvy people said, what does it mean if I say yes? <laughs> And then I said, at least $10,000. And then 12 of them said, yes, I love America for $10,000. So we launched with a budget of around $250,000 in 2011. I quit my job to start Venture for America. And then the budget grew and grew to this year, it's around $6.5 million, thousands of applicants, hundreds of fellows. How many of you like documentary films? Raise your hand if you like documentaries. Keep your hand up if you have a Netflix password or access to it. So uh, there was a major documentary with an Oscar winning director about me and my organization that's now on Netflix. It's called Generation Startup and I have an IMDB credit as myself. Um, you'll see I play the magical Asian man who makes very positive things happen uh, for young people who want to be entrepreneurs. So I spent seven years building Venture for America. I received awards from the White House. I wrote a book. A movie was made about my work. Um, so I was invited when I, when I was invited to meet President Obama for the second or third time. I got to bring one person with me, and I brought my wife. And for whatever reason, I was the only person who brought my significant other. I couldn't believe it. Like looking around, everyone else was like, "This is my chief of staff. This is my communications person." I was like, "This is my wife." <laughs> and so um, when we were walking from one White House room to the next. Um, President Obama was right in front of me, and so I said, you know what, I, I might as well take this opportunity. So I just went up to him and I said, President Obama, I'd like you to meet my wife Evelyn. And he turns around and is like, hello, nice to meet you. Uh, and so this made my in-laws happy for quite some time. Uh, I, I got on their good side for about a week. So I, I received a bunch of awards for the work I did with Venture for America. How, how many of you are from California? Okay, so, so I'm a Northeastern product, and so I had never been to Ohio, Michigan, Missouri, Alabama, Louisiana before starting Venture for America. So Venture for America uh, operated in 18 cities around the country, 
And I went to all of those cities, I met with entrepreneurs and leaders in these cities, and I recruited hundreds, thousands of young people to come join their companies. And I was blown away by how bad things are going in many, many parts of the United States. Where if you fly between Detroit and San Francisco, or Cleveland and New York City, you feel like you are going across eras and cultures as much as you are going from one state to another. Detroit, where I've spent a lot of time, and where that movie was shot, is a city that was designed for 1.7 million people that now has a population of 680,000. So that city is almost two-thirds physically empty. And when you go there, you see that and feel that. And uh, in many cases, you're looking around, you're thinking you don't even know where you are. You don't think you're in the United States of America. And so this is what I was experiencing between 2011 and 2016. And then Donald Trump won the election in 2016. Um, how did you all react when Donald Trump won? <laughs> So when he won, I thought to myself, wow, this is a giant catastrophe. This is an emblem to the accelerating decline of American civilization. That Americans are so desperate and the institutions are so weak that they would vote in a narcissist reality star just for an opportunity to shake things up. And so I dug into the numbers and there's a very, very clear explanation for why Donald Trump became president in 2016. If you look at the data in every voting district, there's a direct correlation between the adoption of industrial robots in a voting district and the movement towards Donald Trump over the last four or eight years. We've automated away four million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, and Iowa, all the swing states that Donald Trump needed to win, and they all went from blue to red. And we are right now sitting together in Silicon Valley, and my friends here in Silicon Valley know that we're about to do the same thing to millions of retail workers, call center workers, fast food workers, and truck drivers in the months and years to come. Now, as Asian Americans, we do not think about this that much, but truck driving is the most common job in 29 states. There are three and a half million truck drivers in the United States, 94% male, average age 49, average education high school or one year of college. Now, how many of you all work in technology? Or Jason? How long do you think it will be before self-driving trucks hit the highways? Five years, three years, 10 years. The best estimates I get are between five and 10 years. And we know here in Silicon Valley that the financial incentives to automate truck driving are staggering. $168 billion per year in projected cost savings, increased uh, fuel efficiency, equipment utilization, and fewer accidents because 4,000 Americans die in accidents with trucks every year. So there's actually a life-saving argument. But on the other side of that, you have three and a half million truck drivers around the country and another five million Americans who work in truck stops, motels, diners, that are going to dry up when the trucks don't stop anymore. So I figured all of this out in early 2017, and I wrote a book about it, The War on Normal People, uh, that was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and spelled out in painstaking detail that we are the third inning of the greatest economic and technological shift in human history. The third inning brought us Donald Trump to the White House, and the fourth, fifth, and sixth innings are going to get much, much worse for many, many Americans. And I have been around the country for the last seven years, and I've seen this up close, what happens when the manufacturing jobs dry up. So this is all what I was figuring out in 2017, and then I know just like many of you know, because you're very, very senior community leaders, you've met the people who run the American government. And one of the takeaways I got from meeting the president, the last president, senators, governors, is that our political class is not up for this set of challenges. They are not forward thinking enough, they don't understand technology, and many of them don't even understand the economy. And so when I was looking at this set of problems, I thought, oh my gosh, we are in big trouble. And one thing I said earlier tonight is that this is not going to be good for Asian Americans either. 
even though most of us are not driving trucks and are not going to be the victims of the displacement, that my parents came to this country because they knew that they could build a better life, career, and a way of life for their family. But the destiny of Asian Americans is very, very much tied up with the destiny of this country. And if America does not do well over the coming years, there will be rising anti-Asian sentiment, and Asian Americans will not be in position to do as well. The United States of America right now is going towards being majority minority in 2045. That's 28 years from now, 27 years from now. And there are very, very few examples in world history of a dominant ethnic group voluntarily sharing or giving up its dominance to other groups. That is not an historical norm. So what you'd expect to have happen over the next 27 years is rising racism, rising racial tensions, and rising economic strife, especially as we decimate the most common middle class jobs in this country, which we're in the midst of doing right now. So when I saw all of these problems, I, I honestly sunk into despair. I said, we are in deep trouble, and our leaders are not up to this challenge. And then I concluded the only thing I could do that I thought could arrest this set of changes is to run for president and to make the case to the American people that we need to evolve our society and our economy very, very quickly and start valuing people rather than capital efficiency, GDP, and, uh, and stock market growth. So I, I own stocks and I like stock market growth as much as the next guy. Um, but we have to build our economy around more human-centered measurements that would actually indicate how most Americans are doing. So I decided to run for president. I'm happy to say I raised over half a million thus far. Uh, Sam Altman, the head of Y Combinator, is about to endorse me. I'm going on CNBC next week, right after the election, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, I show up on Power Lunch, and I'm going to announce that I'm going on a 10-city tour through the Midwest. Uh, also, for those of you guys like, uh, raise your hand if you like podcasts. Some of you. So the Freakonomics podcast is going to interview me in November, and they're one of the top podcasts in the entire country. And so they're, they're interviewing me for two hours, and I'm just going to talk about my book and the economic ideas therein. So that is why I'm running for president. Someone here asked me tonight, like, hey, why didn't you run for some local office first? And the reason I didn't choose to run for a local office first is because we have major problems on the horizon and we do not have that much time. If we have five to 10 years before the truck driving jobs get automated away, we need to have meaningful solutions in place before then. And right now, again, the US government is totally asleep at the switch on this. And only 13% of truck drivers are unionized in this country, so there's not really a collective negotiation, negotiation to be had. It's just going to happen to many of these Americans. So you may ask, and I'd love to take some questions on this, but you may ask, like, what the heck can we do to help the American people and the economy get through this set of transitions? So I've got a three-part plan. I've actually got a 72-part plan. If you go to my website, uh, yang2020.com, I'm very detail-oriented and I like numbers, so I just wrote out a lot of things. But the three big policies, the first is, is called the Freedom Dividend. Raise your hand if you've heard of something called Universal Basic Income. So Universal Basic Income is something that many technologists have projected. They, they think, hey, if you start getting rid of lots of jobs, then we're going to need to find a new way to distribute value in society that will enable people to, to prosper. So Ken asked me an excellent question earlier tonight. He said, hey, unemployment's only 3.7%, so you know, why is this a problem right now? And one thing that the unemployment rate does not take into account is that our labor force participation rate is at a multi-decade low right now. The reason why Americans seem so upset is that the labor force participation rate is down to, now down to 62.9%, which is the same levels as El Salvador and the Dominican Republic right now, in year 10 of an expansion. Almost one in five prime working age American men has not worked in the last 12 months. And I, again, sensed this and saw this when I was traveling the Midwest and the South. So the, the first big move we have to make is we have to start putting some kind of resources in the hands of Americans so they can start making effective transitions. So they can move, so they can possibly retrain, uh, so they can provide for their own basic needs and the needs of their family. Um, independent of whether or not they can find a new retail job or part-time job. 
So the Freedom Dividend would put $1,000 free and clear into the hands of every adult uh, between the ages of 18 to 64, no questions asked. And that would be an incredible boon to millions of Americans because right now 57% of them cannot afford an unexpected $500 bill. And that does not describe your situation or the situation of many people in our community, but again, 57% of Americans cannot afford an unexpected $500 bill. What happens when you're in a mindset of scarcity like that, uh, and I have studies in my book, that your effective IQ goes down by 13 points if you have bills you can't pay. And for those of us in the room, it might not be economic scarcity, it might be time scarcity. I've got two young children at home, I've got a six and a three year old, and there are times when they're like acting up the bus saw, and like you can feel your like, you know, your, your, your self-restraint um, lowering. Uh, and so that is the state that many, many Americans are in right now, day to day. So if it seems like Americans are getting dumber, more impulsive, nastier, more racist, more xenophobic, more misogynist, that is why. It's because scarcity is sweeping this country and we need to reverse it with a sense of abundance. The second big change is that we need to start measuring our economy differently because the truth is that GDP will not have any need for unemployed cashiers, truck drivers, call center workers. The, the market is not going to, to need many of their skills. And so what we need to do is we need to create new measurements that everyone can participate in. Things like childhood success, mental health, community engagement, infrastructure, environmental sustainability, arts and creativity. So you create more goals that more Americans can participate in as we transition to an economy where machines and software do more and more of the work. And the third thing, um, how many of you run a business? I feel like a lot of you. Like, I've run a business too. Keep your hand up if you hated dealing with healthcare for your employees. I hated it so much, where you have to be trying to become an expert in healthcare plans <laughs> and the rest of it. You have to navigate all of these issues. It makes it harder to start a business, harder to grow a business, harder to change jobs, harder to leave your job. It makes the entire labor market much less dynamic. So what we have to do is we have to get healthcare off the backs of American families and businesses in the US. The healthcare system right now, we spend twice as much as other countries to worse effect. And so we need to get healthcare off the backs of businesses and families. And that's something that I'm really excited to do to help streamline it and also make the cost lower and use technology to, to deliver better care. So those are the big three points of my plan. Number one, freedom dividend. Number two, new measurements for the economy so that people aren't trapped in this GDP thinking. And number three, universal health care to lower costs and ease access for more and more Americans. We right now, I have to say, uh, in my opinion, Asian Americans have a very, very specific and special role to play in the years to come. I'm going to tell you guys a couple of jokes that, you know, in this crowd will work. So a friend of mine said, America needs an Asian president right now because it will irritate everybody, but it won't upset anyone too much. That they just need an Asian president to come and clean up the mess so that someone else... And those of you who are Asian CEOs, a friend of mine told me this just the other day. He said that Asian Americans are more likely to be made CEOs of a turnaround that's really messy. And that is what the United States is right now. The United States is a turnaround, and it needs an Asian CEO who's going to come in and make a bunch of tough decisions, and then clear the decks and, and make it possible for the next person. Do that. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, the second joke I tell that they love is that the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. <laughs> And so we, we need to get the systems and numbers right and have a very clear explanation for what's going on. I have now been to Iowa five times and New Hampshire four times, and listening to other political speeches is terrible. Because they have like no numbers, no sense of the economy, like most of it's about love, respect, treat each other great, which I love. I mean, that stuff's great. But it's totally not going to solve any of the problems at the root of, of what's going on here in America. So, I, so some of you, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the support I'm getting from the Asian American community, but some of you, I'm sure, doubt whether or not I can win. I understand, it's cool. I'm a serial entrepreneur, 
and I understand how to get things done in the key deliverables. So one of the big issues you all have is like, hey, Asian American, we're only 5.8% of the population. Like, uh, like, how is he going to be able to compete with these big name Democrats and, and politicians who have like massive levels of resources, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to share with you all something that I hope excites you half as much as it excites me. Again, I'm an Asian guy who likes math. So what I need to do to launch my campaign uh, and win the presidency is win the state of Iowa. Now, Iowa has 3.1 million people. How many, or what percent of Iowans do you think participated in the Democratic caucus in 2016? 40,000. So 40,000 Iowans. So, fewer than 6% of Iowans actually participated in the Democratic caucus. It was 170,000 in 2016, it will be about 200,000 in 2020. So again, numbers. How many Democrats are going to run for president in 2020? 20. <laughs> about 20, let's say. So if you have 200,000 Iowans participating in the Democratic caucus, and the reason that number is so low is because a caucus is a two-hour commitment where you have to go and publicly say, I support Andrew Yang for president to your neighbors. You have to self-organize in a room. You go through multiple rounds. You argue with each other. You debate. It takes two hours. Plus, it's the winter in Iowa, and Iowa is very, very cold. So if you have 200,000 Iowans voting and 20 candidates, how many do I need to win the whole thing? I need approximately 30 to 40,000 Iowans to vote for me because 15 to 20 percent would be enough to put me in the top several candidates if there are 20 candidates who run. So what seems very, very difficult actually boils down to whether or not I can get 30 to 40,000 Iowans to vote for me in 2020. And I have now been to Iowa five times, and what I do is I say to them, how many of you have noticed stores closing where you live? And all of their hands go up. And then I ask them, why are your stores closing? And they say, Amazon. And I say, that's exactly right. Is that going to get worse, or is that going to get better? Worse. worse. And then I give them the big question, I say, what are you going to do about it? And then they say, what can we do about it? And then I tell them what you can do about it is you can make me president, and then I will return to you $1,000 that right now is getting sucked up into Seattle and out of Iowa. You can rebuild your communities and your Main Street economy. You create 40,000 jobs here in Iowa, and you would give your children a reason to stay. And I'll tell you, that message works really, really well in Iowa. I can get 30 to 40,000 of them to respond to that message. I can finish in the top three in Iowa in 2020. And then imagine the headlines around the country and the world when I finish one, two, or three in Iowa where the Asian man who wants to give everyone $1,000 comes out of nowhere and wins Iowa. That is achievable. And that is achievable because of all of you here tonight. Because if you contribute to my campaign, I'm going to spend it all in Iowa. <laughs> I'm going to bring it to Iowa, take your dollars, and say, hey, I have a guy who's dropping out of Harvard Law School as we speak to go to Iowa City and work on my campaign. Because he's a young Jewish man, and he thinks this country is going to hell. And he says, you know what? If I can do something to stop it, I'm going to leave Harvard Law and help Andrew Yang become president. And that, that, this kid is mega talented, and there are many more like him that are working on my campaign. Matt Shinner's over there. He also went to Harvard Law. Let's give him a round of applause. So with people like that, and your resources, and the Asian American community behind me, I can win Iowa, we can shock the world, and we can make history. Because I gotta tell you, the people of Iowa, they take so much pride in the fact that they elected Barack Obama president. And also, they, they actually take a lot of pride in the fact they elected Jimmy Carter president. For those of you guys who remember this, like Jimmy Carter came out of Iowa, Barack Obama came out of Iowa, and Andrew Yang is going to come out of Iowa in 2020. 
Uh, I'm going to close with something. With, I'm going to relate to uh, to you all some things I said to the Apopa Board and, um, and another organization of Chinese Americans. Is that Asian Americans right now? Raise your hand if you feel like we're allowed to become this successful in this country, but we're not allowed to become this successful. Is that what I mean? Many of us feel that way. Um, we feel like we should just be grateful for the fact that we're able to make a good living and provide for our families, and we shouldn't uh, try and ascend past a certain point in American leadership or American society. Now, there are a few things I would want to impart to you all. As many of you, I believe, would enjoy an Asian American becoming president in 2021. I would certainly enjoy it. <laughs> that would be me. And then I would rename the White House the Gold House, <laughs> have regular dim sum offerings, get the best Asian chefs, and we'd have giant tastings in the White House. Oh yeah, you guys like that one in particular, right? Um, but, but many of you think that it's not possible for an Asian American uh, to, to get that far, even though I just shared with you the numbers in Iowa, we could totally do it. So the, the first thing is that um, Asian Americans have a tendency to work their way up within organizations and to be strong workers and think that that will be rewarded. But I'm here to share with you all, politics does not work that way. And if we wait and we think if we have an Asian American mayor or congressman or even governor or senator, that that person will, will just be anointed president because they do good work, that will never happen. That is not the way this country functions. And that in order for there to be an Asian American president, first of all, one of us has to run. Right? The second thing is that we think we do not have that much power because we're only 5.8% of the population. We're spread out in different parts of the country. We don't have a critical mass. And politicians more or less ignore us. And I will tell you all, the politicians do more or less ignore us. Um, that I've talked to people in the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and they do not consider us a very important constituency. At best, they consider us a source of money somewhat. Um, but we don't vote at very high levels. We don't really even donate at the levels that our wealth and income would suggest. So they do not care about us. They honestly don't. Like, I, I have a friend who was with Chuck Schumer, uh, and Chuck Schumer has a lot of Asian constituents, and he just asked Chuck, he said, can you name one of your Asian donors? And he couldn't do it. And he's got a lot of them. He, he couldn't even do it. So. Right now, there is this sense that we're an afterthought in political life, and we are. Um, but this is a chance for us to upend that in two ways. So 5.8% of the population, not a big number, unless you have a wide open democratic field and there are 20 candidates. If you have 20 candidates, and there's an Asian American candidate, let's call him Andrew Yang, and he has a significant proportion of the 5.8%, let's call it three or 4%, that alone is enough to make me a top 10 candidate in a crowded field. That alone is enough to get me onto the main debate stage alongside Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders, and the rest of them. And how great would it be for our community to have an Asian American up there on that stage next summer? And that is completely realistic just based on the 5.8% of the population that we are. The second thing is that you in California are used to being an afterthought in presidential contests because you guys are very late in the process and by the time it gets to you, it's already been decided. But you, you might have noticed that they actually moved California up to number five this year. I don't know, how many of you knew that? They got moved up to number five. You guys would because you're very politically active. Most of you didn't know that. Oh, this is exciting. So before you guys were like way, way in the back, you are like 28 and like no one cared. So the, the Democrats of California said, we're tired of being an afterthought. We're gonna move all the way up to number five. So the order this year, in 2020, this cycle, is Iowa number one, New Hampshire number two, South Carolina number three, Nevada number four, and then California number five. So if you have a crowded field, which you do, the odds of the nomination being decided by the time it gets to California, very, very low. California is actually going to be a hotbed. California is going to decide who's going to be the Democratic nominee. And so for the first time in 
in the time I can remember, Asian Americans will be an incredibly important voting bloc because who Asian Americans in California support has a much, much higher chance of becoming the Democratic nominee. So this is an historic chance. Again, I guess, hope you guys appreciate this. I like an Asian guy who likes numbers. I figured out the numbers, and this is the lever. And the third thing I'm going to close on and leave you all with is that sense that we have that we're somewhat uh, diminished or marginalized or second class citizens. The main reason I'm running for president is that I have been around the people that are supposed to run our country, and we are as smart, as good, as educated, as moral, and we love this country and our families just as much as anyone else, and there's no reason why one of us cannot be the President of the United States in 2021. So, thank you to CC, thank you Ken, thank you Joel, <laughs> thank you Anthony, and thank you all for being here tonight. We'd love to meet you all individually, uh, but let's show what we can do, and let's show what Asian Americans can do when we get our, our heart and spirit into something, and we're going to change the history of this country together. Thank you all very, very much.